deals together with them. Um, so if you're a Singapore-based company working in the crypto field, please do drop us a note and uh, come by. So we do a number of things, right? So we organize events ourselves, in which we invite our portfolio, in which we invite other founders. Um, I think our parent fund, Golden Gate, has traditionally been very good in, in giving back to, uh, to the startup community. They were one of the first funds in, in Singapore here. Uh, they host a, a lot of events. And then um, we are very involved. So once we finish fundraising ourselves uh, for our fund, what I do is like I take a year to focus just on our portfolio companies, go in there, actually help them to help them fundraise, help them hire, to help them grow, help them market. Um, so we want to be very concentrated in the things that we do, and that's why I want to invest in Singapore-specific companies, so I can actually be there and, and actually help them. Yeah. So looking in the, the blockchain space, you already mentioned a, a couple of uh, uh, investments you have, but is there like a, a very particular, like what would be the number one company that you're looking for right now that you want to add to your portfolio? Number one company to add to the portfolio. Um, it's actually a company that I'm, that I'm speaking to, so uh, it's a, we're, we're still kind of, so what we focus on is the open permission of blockchains, right? So there's, there's enterprise, there's an application for that, what we focus on is the open permission has changed, similar to what I see is to the internet versus the internet. Um, one of the companies I'm speaking to now is a Bitcoin-only wallet, and I think they're one of the wallets with the most traction. I think consumer adoption will come from these consumer-facing uh, wallets interfaces. Um, they're very much kind of under the radar now, but I think on the next wave we'll see a couple of these really kind of jump out, uh, particularly like in developing economies where people want to transact peer to peer with each other. I think one, to be an investor in like one of these companies that will then pre be a breakout company, I think that would be a great uh, thing for us to have. Yeah. <laughs> What is the thing you're looking for in a startup? What kind of uh, qualities or what, what kind of um, motivation are you looking for? So we do seed deals, and at seed deals it's very difficult to assess kind of any product or any, uh, any kind of uh, company thing. So I look for like the passion in the entrepreneur and why they're doing it, and pr preferably they have like a track record of like a previous company, or they've done something, they've built something and really the motivation and the reason why they're doing it, I think that will keep them going, uh, even if times are, are tough. So not just financially motivated, we want to do this, like there needs to be an idea behind it why, why they're doing it. Thank you very much, Henry. <coughs> Can I have a round of applause? Thank you very much. Um, the next one in our schedule is Grace, but I haven't seen her yet, is that correct? Okay, so I will skip right ahead to Ina first, uh, of Cocoon Capital. Hi everyone, um, my name is Ina, I'm here to present Cocoon Capital. I'm not Dutch, I'm Norwegian. Okay, Cocoon Capital, we're an early stage seed fund, we invest in enterprise and deep tech companies across Southeast Asia. Uh, a little bit about our founders. So Will was actually one of the co-founders of Kelku that was sold to Yahoo in 2004. He's been a business angel since. Um, Michael here is from the UK. He uh, is a veteran business angel for 20 years. And um, he helps on the business development and team building for our companies, while Will helps out on the tech and commercialization. We like to say that we're a different type of VC, and I wanted to explain why, because it's important for our founders to understand. So, we don't actually take a management fee. Usually, a VC takes 2% per year, 
for salary, for example. So we don't do that. Um, our founders actually don't get a salary. We only get money, or they only get a salary when we do well. So we take a 25% carry of our fund. This aligns us very closely with the founders. Um, we're also capped at the number of deals we do per year, so each partner can only do three deals a year. And that also gives us, frees up a lot of time to spend with the startups and really focus on their, uh, on their venture. Okay. So, what are we looking for? We're looking for strong teams. Uh, as uh, the previous investor mentioned, we're seed fund. Uh, you might not have a, a, a product finished yet. You might not have revenue. So team is the thing that we focus on. We want you to have a problem that you're passionate about and that you have a, uh, a strong selling, uh, a, US, a strong USP to solve that problem. We want you to be committed because we're in the same boat as you and we're going to work really closely with you. So we also want to make sure that you want to work with us. We're also looking for, um, we invest in B2B mainly, and so we're looking for companies with a revenue model that's positive. So what are the terms for a cocoon investment? We like to lead the round, um, so we like to be the first and only investor in a seed round. We take an ownership stake of 20 to 30%, only equity, we only deal with equity, that's an important uh, part. We take a board seat as well, so Will or Michael will take a, a board seat. And we ask for monthly board meetings, which is our kind of tool to help and work with the companies. We also require you to be a Singapore holding company, but your operations can be across Southeast Asia. So we have companies in Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar, Singapore, of course, soon to be Indonesia, hopefully. Um, so how does the application process work? It's very easy. You, you apply online. Every startup that we talk to goes through the same funnel. We take the time to talk to you, to meet you several times. We want you to get to know us, because we want to get to know you and make sure that we can work together. Uh, we will then issue headline terms. There will be a term sheet that's, uh, that will lay out all of the terms that I just mentioned. And then we, we go into due, due diligence process and the time um, to close to the investment is, is usually six to eight weeks. So we do the investment. What happens then? We then, as I mentioned, we spend the board meetings to make sure that you're, that you're focused on strategic, uh, your strategic goals uh, through the 100-day plan. We introduce you to our partners and other founders. Thank you. Uh, we have something called the Cocoon Portfolio Day, where we have that two times a year, where we pull all of our founders together. They get to talk to each other. They get to share experiences. And then they do an update for all of our investors in the fund, as well as our investors in the ecosystem in Singapore and Southeast Asia that we have acquired through the past uh, three years. We give you coaching. Uh, every founder sits down with Michael, has mentoring sessions. And if we can help you, we'll find someone else that can. And even though after you get your Series A uh, investment, we follow you, we help you on the BD, and also in introduce you to investors going forward. So. Uh, we're always looking for great founders. Uh, go online, and learn more about us, and apply. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, I, I was curious. Uh, um, how, how big is the seed round, give or take? Important. Uh, sorry, I uh, missed that. So we invest about 500 to a million Sing dollars. And that's uh, for a 20 to 30% stake in the company. Okay, so that, that would be my follow-up question. If you do a 20 to 30% for a million, then um, how do you make sure that the, the founders uh, have enough equity when you follow-up rounds? Uh, that is an important question. And we, uh, so we're usually in the first investor, right? So there's only the founders on the cap table when we come on. Uh, we make sure that you get the best um, uh, best um, Series A round, and that's how we can help you uh, make sure that the founders get enough equity. But as well, we're so 
we're also very early, so we also need to have a, a decent enough stake because we're in the same boat as the founder. And I have to admit, we're usually more on the 20% than the 30%. But that also depends on the, on the countries that we're in. Based on your pitch, you have a revenue criteria. So what if an applicant has no revenue, but the startup has an innovative model? How do you make your uh, decision? Well, thank you for that question, because we don't require our, our startups to have revenue when they apply to us. So they can be pre-revenue, but we want them to have a business model that works, so that we can see that they will generate profits and not just acquire market share, for example, for the for, uh, for an acquisition further on. So we want there to be a sound business model, but they don't have to have uh, revenue when they apply. Actually, most of our companies don't have revenue. They don't even have a finished product when we invest in them. Yeah. So let's say um, I have a strong business plan and I have no revenue. How will you judge that my business plan will actually generate revenue? Well, we get to know you, we get to understand the assumptions of the business plan, and I think that's the only thing that we can validate, because any, any founder that comes with just an idea and a pitch deck, it's all about the assumptions, right? So it's, it's understanding uh, what you're basing it on, and if it's a real problem you're solving. If we believe in the problem, then we believe that we can get a sound business model out of it. Uh, so I think that's, we go back to the problem to, to really understand, to understand that and to ensure that you're also motivated to solve that problem. And then we think that revenue will come. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Obviously, I'm totally impartial, but uh, Michael, uh, <coughs> was the first ever investor that wanted to help the startup body do our first event and we got in a full room with that. He's really, really interesting. He also has some really good tips on how to get on the radar of the investors. Um, so try to get in touch with him uh, or with Eno, of course. Uh, Grace just ran in. Um, thank you very much, Grace, for making the time. She's been doing a course, I think, for the past couple of days for a large company. So really happy to have you here. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Farm Aid. First of all, it's all affiliated. So um, I'm really, I'm sorry I'm late because we're running an accelerator for the Singapore Tourism Board, um, which I have to go back to. But um, um, so I'm the co-founder of Farm Aid and the managing partner for Farm Ventures, which is a really special fund because this fund's LPs are mostly alumni from the innovative um, co-working community that we have. So the um, the founders that have become successful, you know, Series C, they liquidated Series D, or they have exited, they wanted to give back to the next generation of founders, and so they became LPs in the fund. So I did not, you know, I wasn't born and then suddenly I wanted to be a VC. <laughs> we, we were pressurized to be VCs because the founders really wanted to um, see the next generation. So, uh, three reasons why um, Farm Ventures is particularly special. I think first of all, because we sit on top of the largest co-working community of startups in the region. Um, we have over a thousand members from Singapore and uh, Malaysia in six spaces. This is just one of them. And this um, opens up a crazy, what we call a hyper network for our portfolio companies, right? You want to hire, you, you have GA to hire from. You want to look for co-founders, you have Antler to look for co-founders from. You want connections to other VCs who are also our members, like 500 Startups is in our Amor location. It's all within that directory and that one, one degree of separation. So that will really be um, the first reason. The second reason is that um, I myself am a founder. You know, we believe that founders in early stage companies, the best way for you to learn is to learn from someone who has ju just done three to five steps ahead of you, not ten steps, not one step, right? Because they would have done that mental mapping and that decision making process that you that would be relevant for you in six months time, in twelve months time. So we, I am, I am myself a Series B plus founder who have raised twenty five million dollars. And so the entire journey of how 
lonely and how difficult it is um, to be an early stage founder is in my blood and therefore when we say we are founder friendly, we mean it like we are with you, we are like you, right? So um, I think the personal um, sort of experience we bring is, is definitely a plus. Also, I'm a Kaufman Fellow. Um, if you know the Kaufman Fellowship is the most prestigious community of VCs from around the world. Um, I'm in class 21 and every sort of, we, we, we literally learn from the best, right? Mark Anderson has taught our class before, Mark's sister, to Brad, uh, Brad Feld is on our board, Jenny Lee from GGV Capital is on our board. So if, if you want anyone in the Kaufman Fellowship community, any investors from the US, from China, from Israel, um, that's also in my own personal and professional network. Um, so that's also pretty cool. Um, and the third reason is for female founders or uh, progressive male founders out there, my investment committee is all female and we want to use the unconscious bias that male sort of VCs always use, right? They look for patterns that are like themselves. So we want to do the same. Having said that, our current portfolio has seven com um, companies and most well, five are still um, all male founded, so we still look for the best. So, who have you invested in? We co-invest, we are a seed stage um, fund, up to $100,000, and we co-invest with the best funds around the world because they are all in our Found Aid network, right? So we have co-invested with Mount Hill in Horangi, it's a cyber security SaaS company that you've heard. Um, we have done Nugget, which got followed on by Sequoia. Um, we've done Engage Rocket, an HR tech company. We've done Colf, a co-living company whose office is just there. Um, and then we've done Anywhere, which is a travel tech company for millennials. Um, Nimbus, which is a prop tech and real estate tech company. So we are sector agnostic. We just do not go into biomed and um, biomed tech because that is just a different ball game. We also don't do gaming gaming um, companies because that, that acts more like a production, Hollywood product, studio production um, company. So different gestation periods. But other than that, we make decisions in two weeks and um, really it's just um, two people making decisions and we, yeah, having said that, it's not easy, right? We are still very rigorous. Um, but, we all, but when we invest you in, in, in your seed round, um, we already help you plan for your A round because it's important to know the dilution that you're give, uh, giving up every round. And most founders forget to count forget to calculate your dilution table um, you know, from get-go and we'll sort of handhold you um, along the way. Time's up, apparently. I hope I've covered everything. Oh, I'll go back. Oh, yes. Thank you. Wow, it's been a long time I've pitched. This is really fun that I'm judges now. <laughs> yes. So two questions, how much equity and, and then what other non-money, non-monetary thing, right? So unlike other funds, we actually don't necessarily need to follow a formula. You know, a lot of funds, you know, they need the 20% in that round, they need all that. But we have done anything from safe to convertible to equity, and we have done anything from a single digit percent to a double digit percent. So we don't really have a formula because we don't, we, this is what I mean when we say we are truly founder first. We are not following the formula of the fund, we are following the formula of the founder. It may be detrimental to the fund, I don't know, in the long run, but I hope, but I don't think so. Then the other support is really the hyper connectivity that um, I personally have, but also found, found it has, you know, like almost, um, almost everyone, a lot, most, most people in the startup ecosystem would be connected to us somehow from government to corporates to other, um, to follow on investors. So connections are easy with us on board. Yes, hi. When you said that you are uh, focused also to female founders, how do you uh, build them in the startup community? Yeah, how do you uh, help and shape them as a venture? So the question is, how do we um, specifically support female female founders, I guess? You know, the thing is, I don't believe that female founders is a weaker species that needs help. 
So we don't put them in the corner and say, hey, we need to help this this sort of group. We don't because even found it is two female founders, yeah, and we are as aggressive and as capable and so we just we just put ourselves up there to say that hey, we can be role models, we are uh, you know relatively success stories, right? And success breeds success and success attracts success. And just by saying that we are here and we are here to help and to serve, um, a lot of female founders come to us and they, and they participate in the support uh, programs that we have for every founder. Because female and male, you're made from the same fabric, you know, I really don't... I, I, do you all agree? I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. yeah, thank you. Thanks for me. Thank you very, very much, Chris, for, for pitching. Um, as I told you at the start, uh, I moved to Singapore four years ago, and I came from a corporate job. And when I moved there, when I got off the plane, I literally didn't know anybody other than my wife. Uh, the first event I ever went to in Singapore was at Princep Street at Foundate, which was their first location. Um, and yeah, it's really amazing what Foundate has built up here over time. By the way, I'm still in Porsche. Um, okay, it's almost 3 o'clock, uh, that means that uh, speed dating is going to start at 3 o'clock as well. Um, somebody might kill me, but we are taking a 10 minute break, uh, so Edward, you're right after the break. Uh, that allows everybody to either figure out how the speed dating works or to visit the toilets. Please all be back here 5 past 3 because we're on a tight schedule and I'm Dutch. <laughs>